Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I'm very excited to be back with everybody again for another great Friday night. What a great way to spend a Friday night. Wow. You know, the world, they want to go out to uh, uh, the bars and nightclubs and be entertained. and But... Uh, a great fr Friday night for me and for us is to uh, praise and worship Jesus Christ and, and study the scriptures together. Thank you, Jesus, that you, that you have transformed my mind. You changed my desires. All right. Um, there's a lot of all people in the chat room already. I want to talk to them and acknowledge them. But first, let's let's talk <laughs> to the people here in the panel. Um, I, as I see you from left to right, I'm going to ask you just to say hi to everybody. We got Brother Dave, Dave with us. Hey, what's up, everyone? Just saying hello. Welcome, uh, everybody in the chat, and uh, welcome to Fellowship Friday. Hopefully, you guys had a blessed week. Hopefully, you guys have a blessed weekend ahead. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm excited for tonight. I hope everyone on the panel is doing well also, and uh, God bless you all. Yes. Amen. Amen. Uh, Brother Dave was talking to me before we went live, and he could hardly contain his excitement about he's got some good reports for us. And uh, Sister Lisa is here with us. I want to say hi to everybody. Yeah, praise the Lord, everybody. Blessings in the mighty name of King Jesus. I'm glad to be here with everyone tonight. Uh, hope everyone is doing well as well. Thank you again, Brother Luke, for having me. Hello to everyone on the panel and in the chat. Yes. Okay. Amen. And we also have Sister Paula. Hello. Hey. Hey, everybody. Sorry about my little coughing fit. I just <laughs> I just swallowed something wrong. Uh, good to be here. Happy Friday, everybody. Yes. Well, because you were coughing, uh, we're going to ask you to uh, um, flagellate yourself. If how many how many uh, lashes should she get for that, everybody? What do you think? I say none. My vote is for none. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have to discuss that and we'll decide. We'll make a judgment here pretty soon. How many lashes do you deserve for how dare you cough? <laughs> All right. And we, of course, we got Matthias um, in, in the background. Matthias, you want to say hi to any, everybody or would you rather just? I'll say hi to everybody. Okay. Hi, everybody. All right. And as usual, Matthias, uh, feel free to, to uh participate whenever you feel like it uh okay um well those of you who are with us every friday you you know what to expect but in case there's <laughs> anybody here with us that's new and you don't know what fellowship friday is we don't really have an agenda it's not a bible study it's not a church service it's it's a time for uh all of us who share this uh common faith uh, what i call biblical christianity uh, then uh, we come together and fellowship and, and just have a good time together. And, and the common ground that we have is our foundation in Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to do. And I want to talk about whatever is on everybody's mind. I, I always have something on my mind, but I don't want this these uh, Friday nights to be about me and my thoughts. So I'm going to ask everybody on the panel and everybody in the chat room to tell us what's on your mind and let's start off by just going through the chat room. Let me start at the, the first ones here. Let me see who arrived first. It looks like Richard Arena was, was here first. He says, all glory to Jesus. Let us worship and praise the only one who gives eternal life. What do you think, Sister, Sister Paula? Is, is, that a, is that a true claim? The only one who gives eternal life is Jesus Christ. What do you say? I say, yay. Yes, <laughs> we can say amen to that. And I think that is the uh, part of the, the great understanding that we have to have uh, in our faith is that uh, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' claim that he's the only, the way to have eternal life and that he is the one and only way. He's ex claiming and he's proclaiming and claiming uh, exclusivity 
So, uh, Sister Lisa, what do you say? Yeah, you, you know, I, I was actually just pondering that earlier today, how all the other religions or head of other religions that started did not claim to be saviors. Uh, Jesus is the only one that saves. So it's very interesting. Those that come to him, the Bible says in Hebrews, must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Uh, he is the only savior. Muhammad boasted a lot of things, but he never claimed he could save anybody. Most of these other uh, teachers or um gurus and things of that nature they say follow me and i'll show you the way but jesus said i am the way and so really what it is is a challenge if, if you ask me anybody who's looking for god right and you go out and you want to try to experience god well you you would have to try jesus you're gonna to have to put him to the test and it is when they do that if they are serious they will discover him. There are people all over the world right now that are having experiences that have never heard the gospel preached. And yet the real Jesus is appearing to them and declaring, showing his wounds, declaring who he is. And that all they have to do is how you know it's the true gospel is believe on him and he will save them. And I just think it's the most amazing and most marvelous thing because people are asked us, well, how do you know? It's by experience. We have experienced Christ. This is not subject to uh, just wishful thinking. I have put him to the test and he has been there for me and he has never failed me. I may not always understand what transpires, but he always carries me through whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We, we, we have the scriptures, uh, and that is really the, the, uh, the final ultimate authority and the evidence. Uh, the scriptures even say that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, I believe the substance and the evidence are the scriptures themselves. And so we have that, but we have something more, especially those of us who have uh, known Jesus as our Savior for a long time. We have a relationship that's personal, and and uh, those the, are, the experience of Jesus is also a testimony and a proof of our our, our faith. Uh, so, uh, brother brother Dave, um, let me see. Uh, uh, what, when I say that uh, I'm a biblical Christian, or we we believe in biblical Christianity. Uh, Give me your thoughts on, and I think you can understand. Uh, if you don't, I'll explain it myself. But what would you say is the distinction between biblical Christianity and um, uh, Christendom or Christianity as the world as a whole understands it? Well, for me, Brother Luke, uh, it all starts at the gospel. Uh, Apostle Paul told us that we need to adhere to the gospel of grace and that any other gospel presented to us is an accursed gospel. Uh, so we need to uh, know that Jesus Christ and what he did for us is sufficient to save our soul. And we also need to know who Jesus Christ is. Other than that, uh, you know, as far as the gospel goes, the other, the other uh, sections of Christendom today uh, love to add things to the finished works of Christ. It's a Jesus plus plus gospel. And uh, we like to hold to the person and finished work of Christ. And I think that's what literally separates us from the majority of, of Christendom is that we hold to faith in the finished works of Christ alone. And they hold to faith in Christ plus whatever, their baptism, their performance, their obedience, their this or that. And so I think that's what really, really at the end of the day separates us. But uh, you can expound further, Luke, if you need to. Okay. Well, I mean that that's all all true and good points. But uh, Christianity, as the world understands it, really is a, is a religion. Um, see, religion says do do do, but Jesus says done, 
That's the distinction. In the Bible, we learn that Jesus has done all that is required for our salvation. And what's required of us is believing that he did accomplish it and we have eternal life because of what he's done for us and his promise. And it's really that simple. It's that that easy. But the world as a whole, out of all professing Christians around the world, I don't think more, more than 10% of them would define their faith the way I just did as far as, uh, hey, a, a Christian is a person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation. So that's the, the distinction that I would make saying that uh, I'm a Christian and we believe in biblical Christianity. Um, now there is somebody, yeah, let me see, Mike, he put something in all caps I just saw. So let's, let me see, if you're trying to get my attention, let me see if I can respond, find it here again. Uh, he says, can we talk about where Jesus is when we are in trouble or going through rough times? How do we know he's there to help us in times of need? Well, let me answer very quickly and then I'll let everybody else elaborate more. But uh, to me, it doesn't really matter, Mike. Uh, if Jesus says no to me every single time I'm in need, I cry out all the time to Jesus to help me every single day. I'm saying, Jesus, help me. Do this for me, do that for me, do this for my family, this for my friends, do this for the congregation. I'm gonna ask him every day. I'm just a pain in the butt. I'm just like that uh, story about the woman that was going to the judge over and over and over again. The judge finally gave in and said yes, because he was. she was so persistent. I'm persistent, I've got tr troubles and I want Jesus to help me. But oftentimes I'm not hearing it. Now, Mike, what, how am I, what am I gonna do? Lose my faith? get angry at God, or, you know, and think there's something wrong with this. Uh, no, because I know that he's already done for me everything that I need so that even though this life, I'm gonna have trials and tribulations, I'm gonna have sicknesses. I've had poverty, I've had all kinds of uh, drama and, and problems in my life. And, and, and between now and the my last breath, I expect more trouble, but, I have this blessed assurance of salvation. And if I have nothing else, if Jesus does not say yes to me one more time about anything I'm crying out for, it doesn't matter, Mike. Don't let it bother you. If he's saying no or wait, it doesn't matter because the trials will build up your character. And uh, all that's required of you is that you should have this joy and this uh, uh, peace uh, uh, and, and excitement that you are promised and guaranteed. You see, the gospel is the, the gift and the guarantee of eternal life. People have been trying to get eternal life throughout all of history, traveling on the world, Ponce de Leon looking for the fountain of youth. Today, all through science, they're trying to find some ways to get an eternal life. We have it. If you get nothing else from Jesus, but you have that, you should be jumping for joy, Mike. Okay, who else wants to talk about Mike's question here, his problem? Um, I will. Uh, I was glad that you got to that because I noticed that early on. Um, I think uh, sometimes when we are going through trouble and we cry out to God and our trouble doesn't go away right away or maybe it even gets worse. Uh, something I noticed about the way he works is he's kind of a kill bir two birds with one stone kind of God. So often I notice that um, when I'm going through rough times, uh, I don't notice it's until after, after it's all over, I can see what he was doing in retrospect. I can't see what he's doing while I'm in the midst of it, this is where the faith comes in. I just have to trust that what he said when he said that all things work to, for the good towards them that love God. Um, I just have to keep reminding myself of that. And every single time after I get through with the ordeal, I can look back and see the things I was learning during that time, because I'll tell you, if you don't ever have rough times, you're not going to grow. You're not going to learn the depth of God's goodness when everything's wonderful all the time. And uh, often I'll ask him a question 
and I won't get an answer for years. And finally, when I get the answer, I realize that he couldn't have given me the answer years ago because there were several other things that I needed to learn before I could even understand what the answer was. So, you know, the Bible says that we should praise God in all things, even the bad things. I know it sounds weird, but try it. Try praising God just that you're alive. You know, stop thinking about what he's not doing for you, if that's the case. And I'm not saying that's the case with you, Mike, or anybody else. But I think we sometimes do that, you know. So stop yourself from doing that and just say, you know what? I'm just going to praise God and think about all the things that you have to praise God for. Uh, I guarantee you have at least 20 that you're not even thinking of. And try that. And it changes your perspective on life and it almost kind of opens your eyes a little bit. Yeah, that was very good, sister. Um, as soon as you said that, I was jumping for joy silently over here because that's the thing that a lot of people miss. The God is not a genie in a bottle. And although he, he certainly loves us as dear children, um, his children, he loves us, but he is also going to do what is beneficial for us. And if that means delaying or even denying, <laughs> that's what he'll do. Um, he's going to work his good pleasure, which will bring him all the glory and still bless us. But it, it may be that it takes a while because there are other things that need to transpire for us to grow and mature and even strengthen our faith. And so if he needs to delay to teach us those lessons or have us learn those lessons, he will. Yeah, I keep saying I keep saying amen, and if I, I realize I had my microphone muted, <laughs> so you missed all my amens, uh, sisters. <laughs> uh, okay, um, well, uh, let me quote that famous verse you've probably all heard: uh, "You don't always get what you want, but if you try some time, you just might find you get what you need." Where is that? What is that? Somebody, somebody's chapter. a Rolling Stone fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, even the Rolling Stones, we can learn some wisdom from, from them. You get what you need. And I, I'll tell you, my own personal, I'll reflect on that song personally. I was thinking about this today. Um, uh, you know, I've been working real hard to try to get healthy. I've been through brain surgery, three back surgeries, knee surgery, quadruple bypass heart surgery. Over the last 10 years, it's just nonstop problems, hospitals and surgeries and, and constantly trying to recover. And then there's another problem and then I have to try to recover again. But uh, uh, I'm working hard at trying to change the way I eat, I exercise and everything. And uh, I, I got reports now that my, uh, my my blood pressure and my blood uh, test were for you know your uh, your uh, what is it called your um, lipid blood test for your uh, cholesterol your um, HDL and LDL my numbers are so perfect they're better than perfect right now the best if I've ever been in my entire life so I, you know I had some big problems in those areas but they're perfect and so in some ways. My health is really improved, and I'm just thankful. Uh, a lot, as I said, I pray all the time for it, for healing, and everybody prays for me. Uh, but I, uh, I'm still in pain every day. I'm saying, Lord, take away the pain. Why, I, I, want, I want to be able to stand up completely straight, instead of being a little bent over like an old man. And, you know, it takes me so long to straighten up, and I, I mean, all this pain, take it away. I'm giving it to you, and. and so far, I still have the pain. And then I think, well, maybe this is like Paul, uh, this thorn in the flesh. I think Paul's thorn in the flesh was something else. But the idea of uh, Paul not getting relief, whatever it was, Paul did not get relief. And the scripture says that it was there uh, so he wouldn't be puffed up with full pride, keep him humble. So I, I think this pain maybe is, maybe I need it. 
Maybe I need it to keep me humble as uh, Paul needed it. I don't know. Not that I'm in the, any, should be even mentioned in the same breath with Paul. I don't want to give you that impression. Um, okay, uh, Brother Dave, how are you? Any feedback on anything we've been saying? It's been right on, right on target. And, and you know, I like what, uh, what Paula said about how sometimes, you know, even when God, you know, says no or makes us wait, or I, I think maybe Lisa or Paula said it, I, I can't remember now, but uh, they said something about, you know, even when God doesn't uh, answer right away, it's it's still in his goodness and, and for our good, because sometimes, you know, we get so accustomed to to wanting things now that, that we don't even understand uh, how beneficial it truly is if God does make us wait or says no, and then we can reflect back on that. Uh, later on down the road and, and and learn to be grateful and thankful that God did either delay or say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Amen to all. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's look at the, respond to the chat room some more here. If I can find anything here that we need to uh, talk about. Uh, well, first of all, hello to everybody. I'm just, I'm just thankful that we have this congregation uh, Brother Anthony D'Angelo is here with us tonight. He, he's been in the hospital himself. I've asked everybody to pray for Brother Anthony D'Angelo. He just had a stroke, and uh, I believe he's out of the hospital home now. I hope so, at least. He might be He might be in the chat room right from the hospital still. I, I don't know. I, I spoke to him on the phone recently. So, Brother, I'm glad you could be with us. Everybody keep on praying for Brother Anthony. Um, and let's let's remember to, to call Yvonne Vlogs. Call him Yvonne. I mean, everybody wants their name pronounced correctly, so uh, you know uh, we all naturally say Ivan. But uh, he corrected this one day, so I want to remind everybody this this is Yvonne. And uh, we got uh, Sister Victoria. You know you've been with us for a long time, Sister, and you are greatly appreciated. And uh, um, so happy you're with us faithfully, and uh, I think you and uh, Hendrix are, are uh, the captains of the moderators. Uh, we rely on you so much for for what you do. I I, I see all the time that you know you people have to uh, deal with the problems that come into the chat room, and and uh, Victoria and Hendrix both uh, are are very mature, very wise. The way that you deal with the problems, exactly the way I, I would hope that you deal with it with discretion, but also not letting them ruin our fellowship. So thank you. Um, and uh, Celine is with us again. Hello, Celine. Uh, I don't know what you mean by big girl activities, Celine. Maybe you could elaborate on what you mean. If you want to start doing big girl activities, tell us what that means, if you will. And um, let me see. Okay, and on the panel, um, does uh, anybody have anything on their mind that they want to bring up as I'm looking at the chat room here? If you, if you have any subject or any thoughts or prayer needs or praise reports uh, on the panel, go ahead and shout them out for us now. Oh. Well, Luke, I, uh, I, I noticed a comment in here I just wanted to um, hey. bring up from Robert Wigman. He wrote, best thing I did was to give myself liberty to not believe things will improve, but keep praying at the same time. We need to stop trying to pretend we are more positive than we really are. And I actually agree with you because there's a lot of, um, you know, positive thinking that's, that, you know, is prevalent even in, in Christianity. A lot of these, um, what are they called? Uh, um, the prosperous preachers, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's kind of more like, um, the power of positive thinking. Yeah. The word of faith movement, prosperity yeah, yeah. preachers. Yes. Right. Right. And I like that he said the best thing I did was to give myself liberty to not believe things will improve. Um, not because they won't and you need to just face facts because they may, but what if they don't? You know, uh, there was at one point in time, uh, there was something I really wanted and I needed from God. And I prayed every single day, probably for a year. 
every night I prayed the same prayer. And one night I was praying my usual prayer and I stopped in the middle of it and I said, you know what? I said, I've been praying to you about this for a year now and you're not giving it to me. And I said, okay, what if I never get this thing? What if this is as good as it gets? What, what I have right now? And I said, you know, can I, can I just accept that? And, you know, the verse came to mind where Paul said, um, your, your grace is sufficient for me. And I said, you know what? If this is as good as it gets, praise God, praise God. And I, it totally changed my focus. It changed my perspective on anything, on, or I mean, on everything, the way I was even going through my daily life. And I'll tell you what, he answered my prayer. As soon as I accepted that maybe the answer was just going to always be no. As soon as I accepted that, it was like, and I thought about it, I was like, were you waiting for me to just accept that your grace was sufficient for me? Because once I did, and I truly did, like, it's like magic. He just answered my prayer after a year of waiting. <laughs> hey, sis, how about when that, uh, when you finally accept that, uh, you know, when you finally come to that place inside your like innermost being where you're just like, man, I am so imperfect. My only hope is to trust Christ alone. And he reveals that, <laughs> that his grace is sufficient and you put all your trust on him. It's like, boom, so much weight comes off of you. you do you right. remember that day that the light bulb went off for you? Mm -hmm. uh, for salvation, yeah, I do. It was yeah, for rest. salvation, right? Right. It was rest. That was what rest was. I didn't know what rest was before that. I heard about it. Uh, I could intellectually speak of it, but I didn't know what it was. And I, it was like, wow, this is what that is. It's a complete freedom. I don't know, like just the entire weight of the world was off my shoulders. Like from that, I could have died in that moment and been perfectly happy yeah well yeah. I I think it's natural for us to be very thankful and praise God and give all these pr good praise reports uh, when we're blessed it's easy uh, but uh, to praise God uh, when things are hard I think that would Please God even more. Uh, there, there. I don't know. Maybe there's a scripture specifically on that. The only one I'm Brother, to my, Yes. Well, I'm sorry. I wanted to interject because right when Sister Paula actually <laughs> started talking and my mic wasn't on, <laughs> uh, I'll get it right one day. Um, uh, what what she was talking about? Uh, Timothy. What, no. Excuse me. Romans fourteen eight came to mind. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And I was thinking about how, you know, she was saying, like, she was praying about this thing for a year and, and, and didn't get an answer. And then as soon as she let go of the thing and just said, you know what, God, I'm just going to trust you no matter what happens. And then she got her answer. Um, God is trying to work things out within us to yield to him, to his sovereign will. Cause I told you, there's this whole, this new age concept that we have free will, which I personally do not believe. I believe we have freedom of choice within the parameter of God's will. I mean, I can say, let there be light, but there ain't going to be no light unless I'm standing next to a light switch or I have a flashlight in my hand. And that ain't the same thing. So, you know, but people seem to think they can will things so th through this willpower. Uh, no, you have freedom of choice and there's a certain amount of ability God has given you. And then there are things you just have no control over. But I was thinking about how sometimes we, we pray and he will answer. And then there's other times he doesn't change the situation. You'll be praying and praying and praying about a thing and he'll change your perspective or your heart about the matter. And then there's other times you will see, you know, that not only does he, he change you, he may change both. He may change the situation and your heart about the matter. Uh, I, I've always been surprised when I pray and I say, well, Lord, 
please touch this person's heart to see this my way if I'm correct. And if I'm incorrect, then touch my heart to see it your way, <laughs> you know. And sometimes they'll have a change of heart and they'll come tell me something and I was praying about it and it, and it didn't even take 24 hours. And I'm astonished. And then there's other times that I've prayed and nothing happened except he changed my heart about the matter and gave me peace in the situation to be able to go through what I was going through. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I don't, I'm a little confused as to what verse um, uh, to apply, um, but I think this is uh, the verses that apply to this point I'm going to make. Uh, when Jesus says, uh, love your enemy, um, what what good is it to love those who love you? I mean, even the, the, the heathen, the, the pagans can do that. What he's asking us to do is, is love those people who are um, mistreat us, but love them. That's asking a lot. Uh, and so uh, I, in that same way, I would say that it's easy to praise God uh, when everything's going well. But anybody could do that. Can what, what what I think God really would value and appreciate is someone who can praise Him even in the worst of times. And I see that I've seen that sometimes. I I, I know a couple when I was going to a small home church congregation years ago. That this couple had a wonderful family, and and their high school son um, was killed in a car accident. And. Uh, when the, the way they dealt with it was just, it blew my mind. Everybody was blown away. Uh, their, uh, their attitude was just incredible. I don't, I don't think I could have reacted the way that they did. The, 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 the peace and joy that they still had, even at that worst of time in their life. So, yeah. So getting back to Mike's point is that uh, these problems, if you don't think God's uh, uh, giving you what you want, then... Uh, Appreciate what you have as you know, all this whole part of the conversation so far has been based upon that um, I Want to talk about Hendrick's prayer request here uh, He says prayer request for healing my father was just diagnosed with type 2 arthritis And he has some open ulcers on the bottom of his toes. I think you might have made a mistake I think you're probably saying I mean type 2 diabetes there's no such thing as type 2 arthritis, as far as I know. There is osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, but they're not referred to as type 1 or type 2. That would be diabetes, and diabetes is what would give you the ulcers on his feet. So I think, uh, I think you might have put, correct me if I'm wrong, Hendrix, but regardless, whatever it is, technically, it doesn't matter. Let's everybody pray for Hendrix's father, pray for healing for him. Um, Okay, um, uh, in, uh, Dave or, or uh, Lisa or, or Paula, any, what else is on your mind? Well, Brother Luke, where you were speaking, I was thinking about how, uh, where you referenced where Jesus said, you know, if you pray or praise those who do you well, then what good have you done? Even the heathen does that. And I, w I was remembering a story. Well, a true account is not a story. <laughs> I experienced that in a work situation many years ago where there was a young man who was being very manipulative and abusive in his behavior toward this older gentleman. And what it was was the young man, Holy Spirit showed me, the young man wanted his job. And what he was trying to do was cause the older man to lose his temper and perhaps strike him or do something that would cost him that job. And I saw through it. So I pulled the gentleman talked to me one day, the older gentleman. And he said, you know, he said, I, I think I'm going to lose my job because this dude is doing stuff that's just so over the top. He said, I'm being so disrespected that I'm just going to hit him and go find another job. <laughs> and he literally told me that. And I said, no, no. Brother, I know your mama's a praying woman, and uh, I know she's praying for you, and I'm praying for you. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you something that if you do it, you're going to have so much fun. You're going to blow everybody's mind, and, and it's not going to go the way that they think. It's going to go in your favor. 
and he's looking at me strange. He's like, well, what's that? I said, it's a biblical principle. I said, it's in Proverbs. And it says, if uh, see, Proverbs 25. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So I told him, I said, what you're going to do is you're going to come in tomorrow. And anything he does to you, you're going to ignore. And every time he does something nasty to you, you're going to do something nice for him. Maybe you buy him a cold cup of Coke uh, or soda or coffee out of the machine. You're going to only say nice things about him. You're going to come in and just be happy and excited because, see, you know what's going on. He's trying to cause you to lose your job. (laughs) So he came in the next day and started doing what I had shared with him I thought he should should do and the people in the office that knew he was having this situation with this uh young man started to be like uh is he about to go postal is he about to lose it because he's coming in here happy he's singing he's humming he's not complaining anymore and the other guy didn't know what to do because every time he did something nasty to him he offered he came back from subway with a sandwich for him (laughs) and stuff like that so he didn't know he didn't know what to do and he ended up leaving him alone because he didn't know how to take it and he had so much fun while this was going on watching their reaction to what he was doing thinking he was going to lose his mind he was at peace and the situation flipped in his favor and because the man started being manipulated to somebody else he ended up getting fired for what he had done so and not that we wanted him to get fired but you know some people just they don't learn and they they have to learn their lessons the hard way in some cases but it was an amazing thing to watch it transformed him he had peace and undisturbed composure and he ended up prevailing in that situation mm-hmm yeah. Okay, we got we've got uh, several questions here. I'm seeing in the in the chat room. Uh, maybe somebody could look up Proverbs one twenty two through twenty nine. If everybody could pull that up, Proverbs one twenty two through twenty nine, and read that. Tom Starks uh, wants us to explain that. But also, Richard Arena sa- says, should we minister to atheists, or are we casting pearls before swine? Uh, well, it, it, it doesn't matter if someone's an atheist or a Catholic or a Muslim or uh, agnostic or anything. They're all in the same boat. They're they're lost. It doesn't matter. We we minute, we we preach the gospel to everybody who is not a, not a believer, and even to believers. Uh, I think brother uh, one of the main themes on brother David's uh, um, um, brother uh, David Benjamin in Christ is one of my favorite Bible teachers. If you haven't subscribed to him, do it. David Benjamin in Christ. But um, he, he goes on and on talking about how we need to preach the gospel to ourselves, continually preach the gospel to ourselves. So to ourselves, even to believers and non-believers, yes, let's preach the gospel to everybody. And nobody is, uh, uh, the swine are the people who, when you do preach the gospel to them, uh, they cover their ears and they, they don't have ears to hear. That's Brother Luke, that. I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry, who did, who was that you said said that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves? Because I almost jumped out of my skin when you said that. Because I David, say that all the time. Brother David Benjamin in Christ. That's I, awesome. I, it's I, I, true. If, yeah, if you go to my home, by hearing. Go to my home page on YouTube homepage, and there's a list of channels I'm recommending. Your your channel is on there, Lisa. Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, Brother David Benjamin in Christ. I hope everybody right now uh, go through the chat room and sub to each other. And 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 if you haven't subbed to everybody on the panel, everybody on the panel sub to each other. And I, I ask you sub to all the people on my list. I have a list of maybe ten channels that I, I'm highly recommending. I sub to all those. I haven't. I hope okay, you will sub good. to each other. That's really good because okay. I have family. Yeah. They know I'm a believer. Don't misunderstand. But they, they, they'll they they walk through and they'll hear me and I'll be preaching to myself. And they'll walk through and they're like, uh, who are you talking to? I'm talking to myself. I know I'm talking to myself. I'm cool. I'm working out ideas that I've been thinking uh, in my head and I'm preaching on scriptures and, and just running through them and saying them out loud because 
faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you really should recite the word of God aloud. But anyway, sorry, Brother Luke. Yeah, well, good, good. You have that in, in common. So after, at least after you go to Brother David Benjamin in Christ's channel, uh, I, I know you'll be blessed by it. Uh, but the, the question by Richard Arena is, should we minister atheists? You heard my answer. As far as pearls to the swine, I'm absolutely against uh, 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 communicating and dialoguing, preaching, or answering questions to anybody who's swine. Now, uh, by the way, people get upset. Why are you calling people swine? Well, Jesus says a certain people are swine. And, and what are they? They're the people who, uh, when you do talk to them about the gospel, they, they don't want to hear it. They want to change the subject. I don't want to hear that. Or they mock it. And, and well, fine. If, if You should have enough discernment to recognize they don't have ears to hear. Maybe they'll be ears to hear next year. But back off. Don't, don't cast your pearls to the swine is a valid point, but um, you don't know if they're swine until you try. You have to try to share the gospel before you can determine if they're swine. Okay, uh, uh, who else wants to answer this question by uh, Richard Arena? Should we minister atheists? We casting pearls uh, before swine? Well, no, because I always take the position uh, of the person who's planting seed and then somebody watering and then someone reaps the harvest because uh, a person can only come if the Holy Spirit draws them. Maybe they're serious for one question and they did pay attention to you on that one question. And then they were mocking on the other two or three because of their cynicism or whatever. Cause you know, the devil is going to, he's going to try to block them from hearing the truth. So I don't usually pay attention to that stuff because you know, there, there's a guy that I saw once who had converted from atheism and gave his testimony. He ended up having a, a near death uh, experience and had had a Christian friend who had been ministering, ministering to him for years, but he, he wouldn't receive until he got sick. And the, the uh, medical situation that we, he was in, it's like a high mortality rate. Usually 90% of the people don't even survive that. And I remember in, in his testimony, he said, it's, easy to be an atheist when things are good and you're riding high it's it's difficult to be laying on your deathbed and be an atheist and you don't know where you're gonna go when you die so i, I would definitely say no just just share what you can share if they hear you they hear you if they don't that's that's not on you that's on them yeah yeah uh yeah i want to get to Paula and Dave's thoughts on that question, but but I'm I'm just curious um, why we you would uh, single out atheists as far as should we um, uh, should we minister it to atheists? As I, I tried to make the point that whether it's an atheist, agnostic, or um, uh, any religious person, uh, they they're all in the same boat. Why why are we singling out atheists? As uh, they're not, I would not say that an atheist is um, any more or less likely to, to get saved than, than uh, any of these other groups. Uh, uh, I, and I, we, we had a question on the Sunday panel recently about can, can someone get saved on their deathbed? And, and my position is I think it's more likely as we get older uh, and, and uh, closer to the end that we get finally start getting interested <laughs> and wonder what happens after we die and then maybe now we got some ears to hear. So um, uh, Brother Dave or, or uh, Sister Paula, do you want to say anything about that question? Yeah, I mean, just really quickly, I'm just going to say we, uh, we got to plant and water seed and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature possible. Uh, Buddhist, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, uh, whatever, you know, every, you know, God wishes none to perish. And he has, uh, so graciously allowed us as his children to partake in this, uh, uh, his divine plan to advance his kingdom and, and, you know, uh, the plan of reconciliation through his son. And so he has chosen us as his children, uh, as ambassadors for his name. So I think it, uh, you know, it does a great honor and service to God for us to, uh, proclaim, you know, the truth of Christ to every creature that we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paula, you were an atheist. Yes, I was. Um, 
I would answer that question with uh, Proverbs 26.4 and 26.5. It says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So when I first read that, I was like, what? You're saying not to do it and then you say to do it? And it took me a while to actually understand what he was saying. Um, I think... I, I, this is my personal opinion. I think what he's saying is that there's two kinds of fool. And we're all a fool before we believe in God because the Bible says that uh, the fool saith in his heart that there is no God. So don't take offense to it. Uh, but there is a fool who is kind of searching, who is a little bit open to hearing about God. And then there's the other kind of fool who is not who knows everything that you're going to say and is angry at you just for existing. So it's important to have discernment. This is something that I had to learn too and reaching out to people that later I realized maybe I shouldn't have because they, you know, when you do cast your pearls before swine, the Bible says, says they will turn and rend you. That means they will tear you. And that has happened to me. So God has shown me that I need to be a lot more discerning about um, who I s preach the gospel to. But the thing is about people, everybody needs to hear the gospel, whether they're atheists or not. There's a lot of Christians who need to hear the gospel because they don't believe the true one, that it's all by Jesus. Um, but with all of our relationships, uh, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, our coworkers, even strangers that we see uh, once. I think our whole life should be a ministry. And some people you can preach the gospel to, you can talk to them about it, they're open to it, they wanna ask questions. Others you can't, and you realize very quickly the ones who don't wanna hear anything about what you have to say. But the interesting thing about that is you can still minister to them and still preach them the gospel by your actions and your words, what you do. And even mo more importantly, I think, is how you react. This tells you more about a person than anything else because anybody can say whatever they wanna say and do whatever they wanna do. But when you react to something, that really shows you a person's character and if we are focused on God all day long and we do know somebody, maybe a coworker that we see on a regular basis and we know that they are not interested in anything we have to say about God, you can still minister to them in the way that you treat them and the carefully chosen words that you speak that maybe have biblical you know, wisdom behind them. Um, so yes, of course, atheists need to hear the gospel, but God, you know, he had to work on me a little bit about the discernment, but we do need to also have discernment because some of these fools will turn and rend you. Um, but yeah, I would just uh, pray about it, pray about everything, but ask God to show you like if, and you can tell by a person's reaction if, if you need to just kind of change the subject, <laughs> if they're a little uncomfortable. Um, but yes, of course, I would say yes, preach the gospel as much as you can. And then when you can't do it with your actions. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I like to watch a lot of sci-fi movies and, and I saw one years ago where because of overpopulation, they had to put a limit on a lifespan. And I think at 30 years old, people would automatically die and they had some kind of a meter on their wrist that it, it counted down the minutes they had left till they, they would die. And so they're always aware of how much time they left out left and how much time was time was running out on them. And, but the, interesting thing about it is we we we're all in that situation it's just that we we don't have that meter to look at we don't know i mean uh sometimes death could come suddenly unexpectedly and then but if you're young and healthy you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about uh this death that's uh, there's a bible says we're all have a sentence of death on us but as you get older i guarantee you myself and my friends 
people. We, we think about it a lot more than we used to. And I realize that as my time remaining gets less and less, every day, every minute becomes more and more precious. So the fact that I'm spending time with any of you right now, I want you to know that I, I consider my time very precious and I want to spend it with you. That's how much I love you and want to be with you because I don't have that much time compared to a young person. So these are the things that you, you need to value your time. And if someone is wasting your time, they don't want to hear the gospel and you're just getting into these foolish arguments and it's going nowhere. Your time is too precious to be wasted on them. Go out. I think we're far better off taking the attitude is I want to plant a million seeds instead of trying to water, you know, five seeds the rest of my whole life. Don't invest all these time, this time into a few individuals, but try to get a lot of seeds planted. Uh, okay. We've got uh, any more, anything on that before we go to this uh, question on Proverbs that we're going to read here. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other thing, and that yeah. is to don't forget the power of prayer as well. I mean, maybe there's somebody rather than would necessarily be on your witness list, your mental witness, uh, wit <laughs> easy for me to say, your mental witness list. In other words, let me make sure I'm witness to this person. They may need to go on your prayer list because I, I often pray, Lord, I don't think this person can hear me. You know, I've tried to talk to them. They're not hearing me. I pray you send them a witness that they can hear, that they will respond to. I have a friend, a uh, coworker who is an atheist. He's not hostile towards God. I probably slide him more in the category of an agnostic. Uh, but I have shared with him the gospel. I have told him what I believe plainly. Uh, and I have shared with him in other times, but he hasn't responded. So he's on my prayer list. And and I like as Brother Luke said, then I just turn my focus in other places to continue to minister uh, and reach out to other people. But I just continue to pray for him. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're getting to Tom's question. Uh, he's troubled by Proverbs 1, 22 through 29. So let me read it. And we'll try to figure it out. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you, because I have called, and ye refuse. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Okay, uh, whoever is eager, uh, teach us on those verses. What, you, what do you say? Well, Brother Luke, that section of Proverbs, um, I see it uh, twofold. It could easily be talking about uh, those who have uh, rejected the drawing of God or continually rejected the call of God, and they may have a seared conscience or uh, a reprobate mind, and they um, have hardened their hearts towards God. And so when, when they do call out to him, he, he's not going to respond. Or it could have something to do uh, with those who already believe but have gone astray and to the point where God's chastisement has become so severe, um, you know, that they're they're near the point of what John would, would say, I think, the sin unto death. Um, it, to me, it sounds like it could, it could apply to either one of those. What do you think? All right. Uh, Lisa or Paul? Um, well, I, I actually don't think it's to saved people at all. I think it's to the unbelievers, um, the ones that stay in their unbelief for a while, because it sounds like he, he has been drawing them and calling them because verse 29 says, for they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. 
And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and it's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of it. So these, to me, this is what I take from verse 29, that these people he just mentioned were not saved. And he's saying that he is calling them and they're refusing. And in the end, you know, they have destruction waiting for them. And he says, and then they shall call upon me. But I think at some point it becomes too late. Um, there is a proverb that's not a proverb, a psalm that starts with, um, it's something about I've called you and you uh, stiffened your neck over and over again. That at some point it's just, you're either going to stop calling you or you've sealed your fate. Um, but that's all I got for that. I don't, that's how I take that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that's probably the way that uh, it would be obviously understood. But I, I'm going to say something a little bit different about part of it. But go ahead, go ahead, Sister Lisa, what, what are you saying? Yeah, well, uh, the first thing that came to mind is it sounds a lot like Romans chapter 1, where God has talked about those that they're not believers. And remember, the only person that can come, they can only come if the Holy Spirit draws them. And literally, the Holy Spirit has been calling to these people. Uh, as Jesus said, he has bid those to come to the wedding. That's what we're doing right now. When, we're, when we give the witness of Christ, we are bidding them to become believers so they can attend the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is yet to transpire. And they won't regard our call. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing you have to also remember is the Old Covenant. You, you can't ascribe things under the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. There, there are spiritual truths and, and things, but you have to also understand under the new covenant, it says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered in one passage and shall be saved in another. So we're under a new and better covenant. And the thing is, they have no interest in calling. And what he's saying is when they do call, the judgment will have already fallen. These people wouldn't listen. And when they're crying out, his judgment is coming for them. And it's too late to cry out there because they're going to be judged for their wickedness. They've hardened their hearts to the point where when God is pouring out his wrath, it's too late for them to be delivered. He is coming to judge them for their weakness. They're spared to repent. It's like uh, the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> when the handwriting on the wall happened, it was too late. Judgment had already been passed. So we have to be we have to be careful to understand the, the differences. Uh, when his judgment is falling, there, there's not it, it. It's like you know, I don't know. I've heard different testimonies where literally people have been dying and were about to enter hell, and they called on Jesus and they were saved, and He lifted them out of that darkness. So who's to say I can't? You can't, but He can. And he can say when it's too late. And, and that's why we got to be careful, especially if you are not a believer, to think that you will get that last, I don't know, two minutes, one minute to call on the Lord. That ain't promised to you. The Bible says when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. In book of Hebrews, as his people did in the provocation. The Bible says when they heard him and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they could not enter in because of their unbelief. And it may be that once you continue to harden your heart, you will never respond to his voice. So if you're an unbeliever, you need to answer him when he can be found and call upon him while he is near, because there is a day of judgment coming for everyone. Some of us will meet him as savior Others will meet him as the judge for condemnation, and you don't want to meet him in that position. Well, everybody made very good, valid points. Uh, I, I have to believe that it's never too late for any person to believe and, and get saved um, until, until their last breath, of course, after they die. 
they're I don't believe in the idea of purgatory, and then now they get a, their sins can be purged with the fire, and and so then eventually everybody will get saved. So no, you you got to believe before your last breath. But up until your last breath, there is hope for everyone, I think. So how can I rationalize these verses here? Is God going to really say no when someone actually does believe, become a real believer at at, at that point? Um, I, I think it's God's uh, warning to everybody that don't get yourself in this position. Don't count on the fact that that uh, you know you can be scoring scoring God your whole life, and then at the at the end maybe then get interested and desperate. And don't don't count on that. Even though God will be merciful and 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 uh, God will give salvation even to the last breath, I I believe. But he's he doesn't want us to have that kind of an attitude. The other thing is that the when it says they shall call upon me. I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Now we know that uh, there's other verses, particularly in uh, when Jesus says, uh, "Ask, seek, and knock." Uh, you know, seek and you'll find. And uh, if someone's truly seeking, they're going to uh, find the truth and believe. Um, so, how do you reconcile all that? Well, well, at least I, I will say, calling on the Lord. The, you know, we have a lot of friends that, that they, they believe that you, you can call on the Lord and this is the methodology, the, the, the system, the step-by-step process to get saved. You call on him for, for your salvation. But calling on him means you're just going to him. It doesn't mean you believe. You, you know, you're saved by believing. So you can call all you want, but unless you believe, you don't get saved. You're saved only by believing, not by calling. Um, but this person calling means that they're seeking and and, and uh, it even says they shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Um, so um, just because someone's calling and seeking, does that mean that they actually understand the gospel the way they should? Does that mean they believe the gospel the way that they is is required? That it, it's faith alone in Christ alone. Um, I don't think that we should necessarily conclude that someone who actually comes and believes at that point that they uh he's going to say no i don't think it should be interpreted that way um all right there's plenty of other questions that we need to look at in the chat room the chat room is very involved Uh, any more on that before we uh uh, we go on and there's some other questions here uh let me see Uh, there was one from um um where was it Hmm. There's so much in here, it's hard for me to find things now. Well, Brother Luke, why why don't you just ask them if they have a question that hasn't been addressed to put it in all caps again so we can pick it out really easy. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, if if you have a question that we didn't get to yet, post it again in all caps, uh, and that's a good idea. That would be the smart way to do it. Thank you. Uh, for, for Hendrick says, from stit switch question, how can we explain to sacred namers it's okay to say the name Jesus that is just savor in Greek, savior in Greek, because Greek lacked Hebrew sounds. Anyone know anything on this? Um, Lisa, I think you've, uh, if I remember right, you've, you've talked a lot about the sacred namers and the name. Uh, what, what would you say? Oh, good night. Because of my channel name, those people vex me all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Usually the first thing that they want to start with is, well, there was no J in English for 500 years, so Jesus can't be his name. I just, it drives me bananas. Okay, that's a half truth. And a half truth is a whole lie. The, when you go back and you research it, uh, you start with, for example, the 1611 King James version of the Bible. We don't call it the King I Ames. Why do we call it the King James if there was no J? When you go, I have one that's a, a facsimile. I wish I could afford the, the ones that uh, 
that are actually printed. They're very expensive. But um, this one is where they took like a photo copy of each page and, and put it together. You'll see that all the letters that are supposed to be J are an I. Well, if you study, you go back and find out in Old English they had a rule, just like we do now. When we talk about vowels, we say I before E except after C, right? So uh, they had a rule that if the iota, which was the I, was followed by a J, uh, excuse me, followed by a vowel, it took on the hard J sound. So his name was always Jesus. Jesus is a transliteration from the Greek. That means letter for letter. So that's why they came up with, well, well, then it can't be Jesus because we didn't have a J for 500 years. But they're obfuscating the fact that this letter had that rule. Okay. So you can be confident that his name is Jesus if that's their argument. It doesn't hold water. And I just showed you why. So if you went back and you looked at, they didn't say Iud for Jude's name and they didn't say uh, I aims, as I pointed out, and they didn't say I judges. They said judges. And the reason is because they knew that rule. And in fact, when you go back and read the old English that's in the uh, the 1611, you have to learn that they sometimes put a V where they wanted a U. And, but you make those corrections as you learn that when you're reading it. It's very simple and it's not confusing. Um, the, the second thing is... Uh, uh, let me see, Brother Luke. What else did you address in it? I think there was a two-part question in that. Uh, how can we explain to sacred namers it's okay to say the name Jesus, that it's just Savior in Greek because Greek lacked Hebrew sounds? And he, that's it. Right. Um, okay. In Greek, his name, I hope I don't butcher it, is Iesus. Okay. And... Uh, there's a lot of little stuff people come up with trying to attack it in, in the Greek and say, well, uh, that's not his name in Hebrew. Okay, this is this is the thing. Modern Hebrew is mixed with Yiddish and some other take off, knocked off of languages. Languages change um, quite frequently depending on what's going on. Uh, the English language has changed even from when you can read in the, in the 1611, for example. So they try to make much ado about nothing with this. Um, when you look at uh, the fact that the New Testament was written in Greek, and I don't want to butcher <laughs> the Greek that it was written as, I'm going to butcher it, sorry. Konania, one of them, I can't, I'm not sure I pronounced that right. But the point is, is that there is no command in the new covenant, not even in the old covenant, to say his name in any particular language. So what they're doing is they're trying to bring something and make a law out of something where there is no law. You have the liberty to say his name in whatever language you want to say it in. I don't take issue with people on that, but no one no one has the right to come to you and tell you you have to say his name in a particular way. If you speak English, you know what it is in English, say it in English. If you're German and you know what it is in, Ger uh, in German, say it in German, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have the right to come try to lay that at your feet. It's not any more sacred to say the name of Jesus in Hebrew than it is or Aramaic to say it in English. That's the first thing. And he knows who you're calling on. That's the other. The other thing is, we have been tricked. I used to have my channel name, Yeshua Loves You Too, because I was listening to these Hebraic teachers, and I go over this in my video, Yahweh is not the name of the Most High God. When uh, I did my research, because I had substituted this name, because these Hebraic teachers were telling everybody, oh, this is the true name of God. Well, I started adding it to my praise and worship, and I started having satanic visitations. And uh, I don't want to spoil it for you. Go, go watch that video. I'll tell you the whole story. The point is, is once I renounce those names and refuse to say anything other than what King Jesus revealed. Remember, he's God manifested in the flesh. He never used the name Yahweh. He never used Elohim, Adonai, any of that. When the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's it. We have the Holy Spirit, the Father, 
and Jesus. When the angel of the Lord came and told Mary, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And there is a full on board attack against the name of Jesus because there is power in the name of Jesus. And if they can get you to substitute the spirit of Antichrist is in place of, that means to put some, everybody always thinks it's against. It is, but that's not the first and foremost meaning. In place of, they substituting other names. Why? You go into the Hebraic root stuff, they can't even agree on what it is in Hebrew. There's like over 60 different spellings and pronunciations. Okay, and God is not the author of confusion. The next and the last thing I'll say is that we are to be led by Jesus' example. If he spoke on it, nobody trumps him. And he told us to cry either Father or Abba Father. He told us to, to he said, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, ask that your joy may be full. So he's telling us going forward to ask for things in his name. So we do what Jesus instructs. We go to the Father, we ask in his name, and we believe and we're sealed under the power of the Holy Spirit. But don't let anybody come and tell you that you have to say his name in a particular way. Oh, the last thing I wanted to say. Yeshua is actually a Jewish curse. I don't want you to believe me. I don't know if they've scrubbed the article from the Internet yet. And I know some of y'all, your heart's going to drop because you're like, I didn't know. He knows you didn't know, beloved. He knows you didn't know. But it's a derivative of a Jewish curse, which means may his name and memory be obliterated because the people who came up with this hate Jesus. Okay, so just do a little research. You'll see that that's true. I don't say it. You know why? Because I don't speak Hebrew. So I don't know if a trick is being played on me, but I do speak English. And I know I can determine whether or not I can research something and find out whether or not it's true because that's the language I speak. And I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I, I don't have a lot to say. You covered all of it very well. Uh, I try not to be condescending to, to anybody. And I, I, I don't want to say that, you know, a, a person's position is stupid. I and mean, that would be really uh, insulting. Um, I will just say that the the belief that we have to say uh, his name in a particular way uh, is um, a, a form of legalism that is, I'll just call it ridiculous, it's absurd. And uh, do, doesn't everybody understand that God is omniscient? Doesn't that, wouldn't that mean that God is bilingual? I mean, how many languages are there in the world? If you look at every language where the Bible has been translated. I, I think the Bible has been translated into well over a thousand languages. And if you compare it, I bet you the, the as we spell it, J-E-S-U-S, -S, I bet you it's spelled a lot of different ways in all those different languages. I think God understands all the languages. And I don't think God as a legalist is going to require you to say it in a particular way. If the person uh, understands that this person, whatever they, however they're pronouncing it, is God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God who died for our sins on the cross, was raised from the dead, promises eternal life to all of us who believe in him for it. If they understand that and they pronounce it in any particular way, they're good to go. It's it's absolute form of legalism that, that, that they're doing, trying to impose their uh, one pronunciation on the whole world. Okay, uh, uh, Sister Paula? Um, yeah, that was really interesting what Lisa was talking about. I'm going to have to go watch her video. Um, whenever I hear someone say Yeshua, it's, uh, it's just a red flag for me because the only way you're going to get that name is off the internet. That name's nowhere in the Bible. And these people are claiming that they trust the Bible. That name is, no <laughs> there is a name. Acts 4.12 says, neither is there any salvation, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. And when you go to change that name, that's just huge red flags. You're clearly not trusting in what the written word of God says. Um, and that really makes sense what she said Yeshua really means. I'll have to look into that because uh, their argument is that, well, this is what the Jews call him. 
Well, that may be, but the Jews don't believe he's their savior. So I kind of don't really trust the name they're giving over the name the Bible clearly states. And then also with that whole sacred name thing, uh, this is a verse that I always go to when it, that comes up. Uh, Psalm 138.2, it says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God's word, he himself has magnified his word above all his name. And that should be the nail in the coffin. His word, it trumps any other name you want to have for Jesus. And there's lots of names for Jesus. And you can call him whatever you want, I guess. Um, but I, I like to stick with Jesus because that's what the Bible says his name is. Well, that, that's what it says in our language. Right. In English. Um, all right. Um, let me see. We're getting near the time to, to, to uh, slow up or start here. So, uh, let me stop. Uh, so uh, let me see. Is there anything else in the chat room that needs to be addressed that we we failed to? We did say that if we missed your question, to post it again in all caps here. And, and I didn't see anything new come up. So I, maybe maybe we've covered it all. So um, how about uh, Brother Dave? Uh, you didn't answer this question about his name. I don't recall. So do you have anything to say about that or anything else? Nah. I mean, I. I... I just say the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know, if somebody wants to call him, you know, Yeshua or uh, uh, what's the other one, Hamashiach or all that. You know, I don't, I don't really, I really put too much emphasis on that. But I mean, if you're, you know, if if you're a Gentile, you know, I don't see why, you know, I don't see the significance of calling him Yeshua Hamashiach unless you're like truly a, a blood Jew that you know, has come to Christ by faith and you want to call him by his Hebrew name. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of funny for me, like when Gentiles run around and <laughs> try to, you know, act like uh, they're Jewish by blood or Hebrew. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. I, I just, I personally just say Jesus Christ. And uh, if somebody wants to call him Yeshua or, or, you know, Yahweh or whatever that, you know, that's up to them. I, I don't, I don't dig too much on that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I tend to just say uh, a, a lot of things that some people think are important to them. I say, okay, fine. You're free to do that. If, if, if you think that's important, go ahead. What I, it's like the KJV only position. If someone is a KJV only, I say, fine. I don't care if you're KJV only. I'm not going to try to impose my position. I'm KJV first. Uh, but uh, if you, if you want to say KJV only, you won't look at any other translations. Uh, that's fine. What I object to is when and someone tries to impose their position on the rest of us. That's where the problem comes in. So it's the same thing with this name. If someone likes uh, Yeshua instead of Jesus, I, I'm not going to try to correct them. As long as they're telling me. It's the same thing with uh, uh, if, if someone, uh, um, you know, they, they, speak, they speak in tongues. Well, I don't speak in tongues. I, I, don't, I don't think it's for today. But those who, who do... I'm not challenging it. I'm not. I'm not uh, trying to question them at all. Uh, their sincerity or their validity of that for them. But just don't. If they if they say that those of us who don't speak in tongues uh, or pray in the spirit or however you want to look at it, if, if if they say that because we don't, that's proof that we never got saved because we did not have this uh, experience uh, when we believed. Then they're they're trying to impose that as a test for salvation on others. That's where they're going too far with it. Um, okay, uh, I guess it's time to finish things up here. So let me ask everybody to, to uh, uh, give us a little your final thoughts here on uh, the talk tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Sister Paula. Um, yeah, it was definitely interesting i really enjoyed uh the questions that the chat came up with that was that was awesome um and lisa what was the name of that video you were talking about on your channel yahweh is not the name of the most high god okay okay i just wanted to write that down real quick but um yeah it was great i learned some stuff and 
Uh, it was great hanging out with you guys uh, on the panel and you guys in the chat. The more we do this, the more I'm getting to know your personalities. And it's kind of fun. I like spending my Friday nights with you guys. So thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, boy, I see my time really flew by tonight. Uh, Brother Dave, Dave, give us your summary of, of tonight. Another great Fellowship Friday. Chat was busy and active. A lot of good things said. A lot of great points made uh, by you, Brother Luke, uh, Luke, also by Sister Lisa and Sister Paula. Um, as always, it was edifying. It was, uh, I was glad to be here. And it's, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to discuss the things of God, the Word of God, and to come together in fellowship with everyone, especially in the chat, uh, getting involved with their questions. And, and it's just a good time for me. All right, great. Okay, and uh, Sister Lisa, well, how do, how would you sum up the the discussion tonight? You know, uh, I look forward to fellowshipping with other saints of God. I mean, it's exactly what the Scripture commanded, and thank the Lord Jesus. Even though technology might have been. Some of this stuff is certainly intended for evil. You can do evil with it. It's really benign. It can go either way. Um, personally, I'm of the opinion that when the devil and his angels fell, they ripped all this stuff off from heaven because Satan is not a creator. He's an imitator. And then he revealed this stuff to man who, you know, he promised, oh, I'll show you how to do this stuff if you worship me. And, and that's all it is. But uh, it, you're never going to convince me heaven is not high tech. You're not going to tell me the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be outdone by any of this stuff that man or the devil and his angels can come up with, I'll never believe it. But I wanted to uh, say I, I enjoy the fellowship because there are a lot of people who the Bible talks about remembering the shut-ins uh, when we're doing our ministry, not to forget these people. There are people who could never attend church because of their condition or, you know, maybe they're in prison, but they would be allowed to join a stream like this and, and they can even be anonymous behind these YouTube monikers to get in here and fellowship with no judgment because we have no idea who they are. And I just think it's wonderful that we can come together and praise the name of Jesus and ask questions and share and bounce ideas and concepts off of one another. Um, I just wanted to end with a closing scripture. Um, Let's see, I'll be reading from the King James, and it is 1 Timothy 6.15, which is, uh, let me see, I might want to start the one verse just before that. Let me see if it'll let me do it. I think I pulled up the wrong link here. But it references, it's speaking, it says, Which in times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of of lords and that word potentate means he is omniscient he has all power and authority blessings to everyone in the chat blessings to everyone on the panel thank you again brother luke for having me blessings in jesus mm -hmm. name to all yeah okay thank you sister um well i, I want to respond to john uh j-o-n uh john says uh, this luke fellow always ignored i think he means ignores my questions. Um, well, John, I want to assure you that um, if I didn't get your question, uh, address your question, it wasn't intentional. I'm not singling you out. Uh, I'm not trying to ignore your questions. Um, uh, there's probably several people in here that had questions that, that, that I didn't see. Uh, that's why I ask everybody, if you post your question in all caps, you'll get my attention. Uh, so it was not intentional, and uh, I'd advise you in the future, John, post your questions in all caps, and, I'm, and we're more likely to, uh, you know, recognize it. It's just shout them out. Um, all right. I had a great time and looking forward to next Friday. But uh, between now and then, we've got Sunday, uh, the our church service at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. We have the Wednesday night Bible study at 9.30 Eastern time. So join us for all of these programs. And uh, Dave, uh, Lisa, and Paul, appreciate you uh, being with us tonight. And thank you, everybody in the chat room. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.